Okay, from there we go next in alphabetical order, right? After A goes H. So Yumiyo Harrison, very exciting, unique topic. Uh, doing some comparative analysis, I suppose, that's the way we can put it. In Tanya and some classic psychology. Yumiyo, please take it away. Thank you. Um, okay, so with this discussion, I'd like to look at the similarities and the differences in the picture presented to us by the Alta Rebbe, uh, the founder of Chabad, and Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis. Um, I kind of ran out of time in preparing this, uh, so uh, the last thing I was planning to do was come up with a joke to introduce it, as all good speakers do. So I'd like you to imagine at this point in time that I just told a joke, <clears throat> and since you're imagining it, um, it should be extremely funny. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So once you're all quiet, I'll begin. Uh, okay, so Freud, as we know, his unique contribution to our understanding of the inner workings of the mind was the attention that he brought to the unconscious as a factor uh, underlying all human behavior. However, the recognition of this powerful influence didn't begin with Freud. Uh, we've seen it uh, from, from the beginning of great literature and the conflicted nature of characters, um, we also see very clearly an indication of it within the Hebrew scriptures and the Talmud. <clears throat> uh, in the first Masechta of the Talmud, in fact, Masechta's Brachas, there's a multi-page discussion of dream interpretation. Fascinating discussion of the role of the interpretation affecting the outcome and the results of the dream and therefore the significance of interpreting towards the positive. And the cause of the dream interpretation is not something that only comes later in Tanya, but I'm sorry, in, in Gemara, but begins, as we see with Yosef, uh, after interpreting Pero's dreams, in fact, the name that he's given is Safnas Paneach, which translates as he who deciphers the cryptic. So if that wasn't uh, a precursor to modern psychoanalysis and the role of the unconscious, I'm not sure what is. Um, but the expression of the unconscious as a determining factor of our behavior goes back even further to Avram and Sarah. Sarah exhibits an unconscious response to the announcement of the birth of Yitzchak. It says in Bereshis that Sarah laughed within herself, and it's immediately followed by Sarah denied this, saying, I didn't laugh. There's an interesting commentary, the Sfas Emes, a Hasidic work that explains as follows. Sarah laughed inwardly in her soul. She herself being aware being, being unaware, unconscious of her laughter, and therefore when God admonished her, she denied it since she was unconscious of the laughter. Abraham exhibits a similar unconscious response to the demand to offer his son Yitzchak as a sacrifice. <clears throat> On the one hand, we read that he's enthusiastic, and yet we, we learn that he's crying at the same time. <clears throat> and the commentaries, again, I believe it, the, the Svas Emes again, explains that his conscious mind was focused on the <clears throat> joyful, joyful privilege of serving God, while at the same time, his deep unconscious love for his son caused him to experience tears simultaneously. So then, <clears throat> what is the unique contribution of Freud? He was the first to systematize the concept of the unconscious as a driving force behind our actions. <clears throat> the assumption that exists is that the psyche uh, in man, uh, there, there, there's the psyche in man which uh, certain factors operate without being consciously aware of them, but they influence our conscious life. Um, and <clears throat> trying to get to the root of problems <clears throat> is 
the process of psychoanalysis rather than focusing just on their external manifestation. So he's, com he's credited with a completely innovative approach to helping people overcome their problems by helping them face those aspects of themselves they try to hide, all of their selfish desires. So in this discussion, I'd like to show how this approach to treatment was not as unprecedented as is commonly thought to be. There was a very similar approach developed by the Alter Rebbe and described in Tanya, <clears throat> the founding work of Chabad Chassidim. But before getting into this comparison, I think it's important to clarify an element of confusion that exists in regard to the most important and most understood term that Freud used. <clears throat> the term I'm referring to is psyche, which is the root of psychology and all of its derivatives, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, analytic psychotherapy. Um, when Freud was translated into English for American audiences, uh, there was an effort made to make his work sound more formal and scientific. And as a result, psyche was translated as mind. But we know that Freud was extremely precise in his uh, use of the German language. And had he wanted to restrict his field of study to the mind, there was a more specific word he could have chosen, which is geistig which means mind. The fact that he didn't, that he specified a word that means clearly soul, something that would capture the full richness of human experience is significant. And psychotherapy, as he conceived of it, was a treatment of the soul. Now, that's not to suggest that Freud was, uh, had any kind of spiritual concept in mind. We know that he was a devoted atheist. But <clears throat> it was more than just the mind that he was interested in. It was the complex inner workings of the person that he was addressing. And yet, <clears throat> while he wasn't religious, <clears throat> he was deeply connected and took great pride in his Jewishness. He saw it as the motivating factor of all of his life and work. Um, and so, although he doesn't specifically refer to Kabbalah or Hasidus in any of his written works, we know that he maintained a lifelong interest in the topic. Uh, he conversed with keen interest with a famous Lithuanian rabbi, Chaim Bloch. And we also know that he met many times with the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe. <clears throat> now, getting back to the Tanya, which was written approximately 100 years before Freud and, and was a vast project that was born out of years of individual counseling that the Alter Rebbe provided his Hasidim. It's not as one might think of a, of a work of Hasidus, a theoretical work of detached speculation. <clears throat> it was written to address issues of the soul that the Alter Rebbe repeatedly saw a rise again and again with people that came to him for guidance. So it's interesting that even before delving into the depth of an analysis of these issues, that the Alter Rebbe was acutely aware of the importance of the therapeutic process. Before we get into Tanya at all, before we even reach chapter one, the Alter Rebbe comments on the irreplaceable dynamic that exists between two people that no book could possibly capture. And so therefore he implores his Hasidim to make themselves available to those who seek their guidance and understanding when studying the Tanya. And the role of the mentor or the mishpia that helps guide a person in their spiritual journey is a cornerstone of Hasidic life till this day. But the Tanya was innovative in a number of ways. It charted a completely new direction from the works of moral and ethical guidance that had existed before it. The works before it were known as Musser. And the ways in which the Tanya differed, first of all, it wasn't addressing specific ethical issues. 
but rather one's overall relationship with God. It was a system that, if understood, could provide answers to any particular issue that a person faced in their life. More significantly, though, unlike Musser, it did not make its focus the process of turning away from evil, of sur mera. Rather, it focused its energies on doing good, asay taif. But there's also a more subtle, and I think even more profound break that the Tanya makes with all of the works of Musser that came before it. Musser typically spoke about the ideal, the ideal person becoming the tzaddik. The Alter Rebbe, on the other hand, makes it clear that his work is not addressed for the tzaddik, but rather for the average person. The Alter Rebbe understood the kinds of struggles a person faces throughout their life and had no illusions um, that one over time would become a tzaddik. A tzaddik was a unique creation. In fact, the Alter Rebbe spends a great deal of the Tanya speaking about the importance of this average person's struggles, explaining that, that they are the very reason a person was created, and when a person overcomes them, it gives incredible pleasure to God. And so it's interesting to see the beginning here of this non-judgmental stance that would a hundred years be hundred years later be taken up by psychoanalysis. In the beginning chapters of Tanya, before getting into a detailed discussion of the whole process of how a person connects to God, the Alter Rebbe maps out the architecture of the soul. And his description, in many ways, a precursor to Freud's description of the unending tension between con the conscious and the unconscious. The Tanya describes man as having multiple personalities and clearly distinguishes the I, the ego of the person, and his conscience. However, unlike Freud and his followers that had a one-dimensional model of the soul, the unconscious described by the Alter Rebbe is composed of two distinct souls, an animal soul that is defined as serving the self and a divine soul that wants only to serve God. And the conscious mind of the person is the battleground on which the infinite conflicts between them are carried out. The Alter Rebbe describes the person as a beleaguered fortress and each soul is competing for complete control over the person's conscious thought. The Alter Rebbe had an understanding of the animal soul and all its complexity and contradictions that a few generations later would be rearticulated in secular terms by Freud. It was said that Freud was the first person to map out the contents of the basement of our soul. With psychoanalysis, he helped us become comfortable to enter into that basement. And from there, according to Freud, came all of, our, all of the motivations that, dis, that define our conscious actions. The, the Alter Rebbe also takes us to the basement of our soul with Tanya. There's no illusions as to who the person is and the types of conflicts that we face. The difference, however, is that once the Alter Rebbe reaches the basement, he doesn't stop. He brings our attention to a small door, secretly hidden away in the floor of the basement. A door that leads to a sub-basement, the true core and essence of the person, the godly soul. And even in regard to the animal soul, the Alter Rebbe teaches it's not evil, as it had been described in all of the works that came before the Tanya. It's not evil any more than an animal is evil. In fact, in regard to the two souls, it's a far more powerful soul. It just needs direction. The divine soul is seen as the mature, conscious person, knowing purpose, that's able to provide the leverage to the animal soul to accomplish great things that the divine soul on its own could never achieve. The soul, in its essence, doesn't want to sin. 
it wants pleasure. If the only pleasure it knows is a base self-serving pleasure, then that's what it's going to pursue. Our goal, one that we're helped to achieve through the in-depth study of works of Hasidus, in particular the Tanya, is not to reject things as evil, but rather to discover the incredible pleasure that comes from connecting to God. And to meditate on God, the ultimate source of the most refined and overwhelming pleasure, to such an extent that our desire to cleave to God pushes away other desires for lesser things. And so in closing, I believe there's a rich treasure still to be shared with the, world, with the world in the teachings of Tanya. Unlike contemporary psychotherapy that makes us comfortable with ourselves, but can, cannot offer any purpose or meaning beyond that, the psychology in Hasidus gives us something more to live for, a larger purpose than just personal comfort. It gives us an infinite goal to strive towards with constant room for self-improvement to live a deeper and more meaningful life. Thank you. Rafael. Yo. Very, very much enjoyed and appreciated. We're going in alphabetic order, but I have to say that it just dawned on me that we are going uh, Niglech Siddhis, Niglech Siddhis. So we began with Halacha, with uh, Menachem Mendel Azulai, and from there we went to some deep Chassidus from Rabbi Yo, and we thank you for that. And from there, 